I'll marry the first woman who walks through that door, declared the company director with defiant arrogance. But when the door creaked open to reveal a filthy beggar, her tattered rags and grimy face a shocking sight, his bravado shattered and his complexion drained to a ghostly white. The spacious office was cloaked in silence, save for the occasional bubbling of an aquarium tucked into the corner and the chuckles of a young man sprawled on the leather couch. His long legs dangled lazily over the armrest as he tapped away at his smartphone, grinning at whatever flirtatious exchange held his attention. Orson Levine, deputy director of the major fashion company Silhouette, was unapologetically engrossed in texting. The company specialized in Pret-a-Porter designer clothing, boasting a nationwide network of boutiques. Despite his laid-back demeanor, Orson was undeniably competent, though his methods often grated on those around him. Meanwhile, Theo Alaric, the current head of Silhouette, was anything but relaxed. The company, a legacy passed down through generations, was teetering on the edge of collapse. Theo paced restlessly in front of the panoramic window, his reflection in the glass a stark contrast to the vibrant skyline beyond. The tailored lines of his suit jacket barely concealed the tension in his broad shoulders. With a sharp exhale, he yanked off the jacket and tossed it over the back of his chair. His piercing gaze landed on Orson, who was entirely too amused with himself. Unbelievable, Theo muttered under his breath. His eyes narrowed as he snatched a pen from the desk and hurled it at Orson with perfect accuracy. Ow! Orson exclaimed, startled, as the pen bounced off his forehead. He sat up, rubbing the spot with mock indignation. What the hell, man? What was that for? For being insufferably cheerful while I'm drowning here, Theo barked, his frustration palpable. Have you heard a single word I've said, or have you been too busy sexting God knows who? Orson sighed theatrically, setting his phone aside as he swung his legs off the couch and leaned forward. Theo, buddy, I've been listening. I always listen. Months of listening, in fact. Let me summarize for you. Designers poached overseas, fashion shows sabotaged, entire collections stolen. It's like the world conspired to kick silhouette while it's down. But wasn't your brilliant solution the merger with that Japanese company? You know the one that could make us an international powerhouse. I mean, come on. Asia is the epicenter of cool right now. BTS idols, anime, samurai vibes, they're all the rage. This partnership could put Silhouette on the map worldwide. Theo rolled his eyes. BTS is Korean, Orson, not Japanese. Details, Orson dismissed with a wave of his hand. The point is, you pulled off the impossible, Theo. Your dad would never have managed a deal with Haruto Takasawa. That man's practically a myth. Leader of the Eastern fashion industry, notoriously private, hasn't set foot in the States in decades. And yet, you got him to agree to come here and talk business. That's huge. So why the doom and gloom? Is this about Lyra? At the mention of his fiance, or rather, his ex fiance, Theo's expression darkened. He pressed his fingertips to his temples, as if trying to smooth out the worry lines etched there. No. I mean, yes. It's all connected, Theo snapped, his voice edged with bitterness. Do you know how much effort it took to win Haruto Takasawa's trust? I've spent months negotiating. I spoke with him directly. Do you know how rare that is? He told me he misses America, that he sees it as a treasure trove of traditions and family values. His mother was American, you know. He even lived here as a boy before moving to Japan. This was supposed to be his first trip back in decades. I promised him tours of historic landmarks, a genuine American experience. And, Orson interrupted with a yawn, clearly unimpressed. Did Mount Rushmore get up and walk away? Are the presidents no longer carved into stone? Theo glared at him unamused. He leaned heavily on the edge of the desk, the weight of his frustration evident in his posture. His dark brown hair fell messily over his forehead as he raked his fingers through it. The problem is, Theo said through gritted teeth, Takasawa values traditions above all else. He won't enter into business with a young bachelor. It's one of his personal quirks. Maybe it stems from his childhood, I don't know. He was raised by a single mother and went through a lot. He didn't even meet his father until much later in life.
Maybe he's the product of some Olympic romance? Orson quipped, his trademark smirk firmly in place. Theo gave a tired shrug, his brow furrowed. Who knows? But the fact remains, he idolizes his wife and children and respects those who share his values. He's coming here with his family, Orson. I promised to introduce him to my fiancé. I even invited him to the wedding. If I tell him now that the wedding's off because my fiancé cheated on me, I don't know if he'll still want to sign the contract. Orson leaned back in his chair, a mix of disbelief and irritation crossing his face. He wouldn't cancel everything just because your fiancé turned out to be unfaithful, would he? It's not like you cheated on her. Hell, this could even work in your favor. He might pity you, the poor betrayed bachelor, and sign the deal out of sympathy. Theo shook his head, slumping against the desk as though the weight of the past week were pressing down on him all at once. You don't understand, he said quietly. To Takasawa, family isn't just a lifestyle. It's a cornerstone of his philosophy. The deal hinges on his belief that I embody the same principles. Telling him I was cheated on doesn't make me sympathetic. It makes me unstable in his eyes. His voice cracked slightly, betraying the raw wound left by Lyra's betrayal. Orson's teasing expression softened for a moment. Okay, I get it. But man, you can't beat yourself up for this. It's not like you could have seen it coming. Theo let out a dry laugh, devoid of any real humor. That's the thing, Orson. I didn't see it coming. I thought we were happy. I thought everything was fine. He ran a hand through his dark hair, his mind drifting back to when he'd first met Lyra. It was at one of Silhouette's fashion shows, a glamorous affair meant to launch a new collection. She was a model, of course. Stunning brunette hair that fell in waves down her back, piercing eyes that reminded him of Angelina Jolie, and a presence that commanded attention. Yes, it was a cliché story. The owner of the company falling for the star of the show, but who wouldn't have fallen for her? For three years, Theo thought their relationship was picture perfect. A year ago, he had proposed to her during a vacation in the Maldives. It was the kind of moment that could have been plucked straight out of a romance movie. Waves lapping at their feet, the setting sun painting the sky in hues of gold and pink, and Lyra saying yes through tears of joy. They had even set a wedding date. But then, like a cruel twist in a poorly written script, everything unraveled. Just last week, Theo had stumbled across her betrayal. He hadn't snooped through her phone. It had been pure rotten chance. The top-of-the-line smartphone he had gifted her ended up in his hands at the exact moment her lover messaged her. Theo could still see the message clearly in his mind, as though it had been burned into his memory. Last night was incredible. I can't stop thinking about you. You're the most beautiful woman I've ever held in my arms. The man had even attached a photo, a photo of Lyra, naked in bed, wrapped in hotel sheets that Theo didn't recognize. He didn't need to investigate further. The evidence was damning enough. Lyra had been sending the man explicit photos, arranging rendezvous, and carrying on an affair right under Theo's nose. She had betrayed him without a second thought. The memory of that moment hit Theo like a gut punch every time he thought about it. He had acted immediately, throwing her out of his apartment, the same apartment she had been living in, rent-free, and cutting off all ties. Lyra had cried, begged for forgiveness, even dropped to her knees, pleading with him to give her another chance. But for Theo, betrayal was unforgivable. It was a line you didn't cross no matter the circumstances, and once you did, you were dead to him. She begged, you know, Theo said quietly, his voice heavy with bitterness. She actually had the audacity to beg me to forgive her. What did you do? Orson asked, his voice uncharacteristically gentle. I told her to get out, Theo replied, a steely edge returning to his tone. I didn't even want to hear her excuses. There's nothing she could have said that would have changed anything. Orson whistled low, shaking his head. You've got a stronger stomach than I do, man. I would have probably lost my mind. I didn't have time to lose my mind, Theo muttered. 
not with Takasawa and his family practically on my doorstep. They're expecting to be greeted with bread, salt, and a bride. Tomorrow. Orson's jaw dropped slightly. Wait, tomorrow? As in, less than 24 hours from now? And you're just casually dropping this bomb on me now? Theo shot him a withering look. What do you think I've been talking about for the past hour? But where was he supposed to find a bride? You couldn't just buy one at the market like a carrot. Well, maybe on the black market. But that wasn't exactly legal or aligned with the moral values Haruto Takasawa cherished. I can't risk it, Theo muttered, his voice low but firm. I don't want to look like a fool or a failure in his eyes. If I can't even keep a fiancé, how could he trust me to run a company? So, what's the plan? Orson asked, arching an eyebrow. Hire an actress? I'll keep it simple. Theo grumbled, crossing his arms and glaring at the door as though daring it to produce a solution. I'll marry the first woman who walks through that door. Orson erupted into laughter, doubling over and slapping his knee. Man, I hope it's Serena from accounting, the one you just can't seem to send into retirement, he cackled, conjuring up an image of the grumpy stout woman who had a fondness for garish green and blue makeup. Or better yet, Lyra herself. Maybe she'll come crawling back, begging for forgiveness. Oh, that would be priceless. Orson laughed harder, his amusement bordering on hysterics, until a sudden knock on the door cut through the room. Orson froze mid-laugh, his eyes widening in mock horror. He turned to Theo, who had stiffened like a deer in headlights. With exaggerated drama, Orson threw out his arm and proclaimed, Do you hear that? Fate is knocking. Shut up. Theo growled, his irritation simmering as he strode toward the door. I'm not expecting anyone, not even Isolde. Isolde, his secretary, was currently on maternity leave and juggling her complicated pregnancy. Between her frequent absences and emotional outbursts, Theo had started to fear her. She'd been in the process of finding a replacement, but Theo couldn't recall if she had mentioned anyone coming in today, or maybe he just hadn't been listening. With a sharp tug, Theo flung open the door and immediately froze. Standing there was, well, something. Curious, Orson leaned over Theo's shoulder, his expression transforming into one of unfiltered amusement. Wow, he exclaimed, his tone dripping with sarcasm. A vagabond. What's this? Have people started begging for arms in offices instead of subway cars? The young woman at the door visibly flinched at his words, her cheeks flaming with embarrassment. To Orson's credit, his assessment wasn't entirely baseless. The girl looked as though she had been through a war zone, or at least a particularly aggressive coffee shop. Her hair was a tangled mess, as if she'd fallen off a haystack and braked with her head, and her white blouse bore a conspicuous coffee stain. Her skirt was frayed at the hem, and her tights, had a noticeable tear just above the knee. But despite her disheveled appearance, the girl squared her shoulders, stood tall, and fixed Orson with a fiery glare. I'm not here for charity, she said sharply, her voice brimming with defiance. I'm here for a job interview. Orson raised an eyebrow, genuinely intrigued. What interview? The secretary position, she explained, brushing futilely at her skirt in an attempt to appear more presentable. I called and spoke to Isolde yesterday. We met briefly, and she told me to come today at 10 sharp to meet with you. So, here I am. Theo blinked, trying to recall any mention of a candidate. Either Isolde hadn't informed him, or she had forgotten entirely, a common occurrence these days. Ever since her second trimester, Isolde had been prone to forgetfulness, emotional breakdowns, and bizarre cravings for pickles and peanut butter. Theo hadn't known what to do when she burst into tears over a misplaced stapler last week. Still, her choice in candidates was unusual. He studied the girl, Amanda Marcellus, as she had introduced herself, trying to reconcile her current state with the professional standard silhouette was known for. She didn't look the part, but there was something about her that piqued his curiosity. Theo stepped aside, motioning for her to enter. Come in, Amanda, he said, his tone measured. Amanda hesitated, her eyes darting between Theo and Orson, who was now watching her with a bemused smirk. Finally, she nodded and stepped into the office, 
clutching her bag tightly as though it were her lifeline. Amanda hesitated before sitting, eyeing the chair with a mix of trepidation and guilt. She was clearly worried she might dirty the pristine leather, but Theo gestured firmly for her to sit. Finally relenting, she perched on the edge as though ready to spring up at any moment. Theo took the chair opposite her and began leafing through her resume. Meanwhile, Orson, unburdened by any sense of decorum, wandered around the office like Hamlet's father's ghost. He occasionally stopped behind Amanda to catch Theo's eye, miming increasingly absurd gestures. A dramatic swoon here. An imaginary ring slipped onto his own finger there. Theo tried to ignore him, though every exaggerated movement from his friend made his fingers itch for a pen to throw. With great restraint, he opted to focus on Amanda instead. So, Theo began, his tone neutral. Isolde thinks you're a good fit? Amanda nodded, though her expression betrayed a flicker of doubt. To be honest, your secretary started crying and hugging me after our talk, she admitted. I'm not sure if she liked my answers and qualifications or just felt sorry for me. Theo glanced at Amanda again, taking in her disheveled appearance. He could see why someone might pity her, though he wasn't about to admit it. Amanda, noticing his look, immediately straightened and spoke in her own defense. Listen, I don't always look like this, she blurted out, her cheeks pink. I'd hope not, Theo said, allowing a small smile to break through his otherwise stoic demeanor. Amanda exhaled sharply, her frustration bubbling to the surface. You see, today didn't start well at all. First my phone broke, then Kieran and I overslept. I had to feed him, get him ready, and rush him to school. And just when I thought I'd made it, that awful teacher caught me, Mrs. Jones. I've been dodging her for almost two months, but because I was late, she cornered me and wouldn't let me go until I told her everything about school life. Theo raised an eyebrow, intrigued despite himself. Wait, who's Kieran? My son, Amanda replied without hesitation, but seeing the raised eyebrows and surprised expressions from both men, she quickly corrected herself. Well, actually my little brother. Our parents passed away last winter, it was an accident. I took custody of him. Her tone was factual, matter of fact, but Theo felt the weight of her words. For a moment, the image of this disheveled young woman was replaced by something stronger, someone who had clearly carried far more than her share of burdens. He realized why Isolde might have been moved to tears. He glanced down at her resume again. It was sparse, almost alarmingly so. From what he could piece together, Amanda was still technically a student. Instead of finishing her senior year, she had taken academic leave and was now searching for a job to support herself and her brother. Amanda, perhaps noticing his hesitation, suddenly sat up straighter. Kieran hardly ever gets sick, she announced fervently, her tone suggesting this was critical information. Theo blinked, caught off guard by the abrupt change in topic. Why, would I need to know that? Are you bragging? No. Amanda flushed. I mean, I just thought it might help. I'm not going to miss work because of a child, I promise. Even when his whole class got wiped out by a stomach virus, then chickenpox, Kieran didn't so much as cough. Theo raised a skeptical eyebrow but decided to let it slide. Let's assume that's true. Now, about your appearance. I'll be honest. I thought you might have been wrestling for a janitorial position. Though, judging by the empty hallway, it seems you're the only candidate. Amanda's shoulders slumped slightly, her blush deepening. She lowered her lashes, clearly trying to maintain her composure. After a moment, she sighed heavily. Well, after Mrs. Jones finally let me go, making me swear to attend some meeting and pay yet another fee for who knows what, I spilled coffee on myself. That teacher is a menace, Amanda grumbled. Then her indignation surged back, her voice tinged with disbelief. Really, why does Kieran's second grade class need to fund a computer lab? He's seven. He's not going to use it for years. It's just another excuse to squeeze money out of us. Orson, who had been silent for once, let out a low whistle. You're feisty, I like that. But you've got to admit, he added, gesturing at her. If this is your version of interview chic, it's bold. Amanda shot him a glare, her embarrassment turning to frustration. I told you, it's not usually like this. 
I didn't plan to look like I just fought a tornado. Realising she had veered off course, Amanda cleared her throat and tried to steer the conversation back on track. Anyway, she said, clasping her hands together in a gesture that betrayed her lingering nerves. Like I said, today hasn't exactly been my day. On my way to the interview, my neighbour called to say Rob flooded our apartment. Rob, from the third floor, drinks, you see. He's caused trouble before, but this time he really outdid himself. The ceiling in our kitchen is swollen. I had to drop everything, run back home, call the repair service, and leave the neighbour on watch duty. Then I rushed back here. But after that, things just kept going wrong. A car splashed me with water, no, wait. Actually, the taxi door caught my skirt, and when the car jerked forward, I fell into a puddle. I broke my heel, tore my clothes, and... She gestured at the coffee stain on her blouse. Some guy bumped into me in your building and spilled coffee on me. I thought about going home to change, but I was already so close to your office, so I decided, what the heck, what's one more disaster in a day like this? Orson, who had been leaning lazily against the wall, couldn't suppress a snicker. You're certainly bold, I'll give you that, he said with a bemused smirk. But showing up at Silhouette, a company known for its beauty standards, looking like this, what were you expecting? Haven't you heard the saying, people are judged by their appearance? Amanda's frown deepened as she turned to glare at him. Haven't you heard the saying, don't judge a book by its cover? She shot back. Theo, ignoring Orson's antics, leaned forward slightly, resting his elbows on the desk as he focused on Amanda. Tell me, Amanda, he said, his tone calm but curious. Why aren't you looking for work in your field? He glanced again at her resume, his eyes briefly lingering on her photo. In it, she wore glasses and neat braids, looking every bit the studious straight-A accountant. Amanda sighed, her posture wilting slightly. I've tried, she admitted, but no one will hire me. Every job I've applied for wants experience, and if you don't have it, they either pay very little or nothing at all. Some companies expect you to work for free for the first two or three months, as part of an unpaid internship, with no guarantee of a job afterward. I can't afford to work for free, she added, frustration creeping into her voice. I have to feed and clothe Kieran take him to soccer practice, and apparently fund a computer lab for his school. He's only in second grade. By the time he gets to use that lab, I'll probably have grey hair. Theo studied her more intently now. Despite her chaotic appearance, there was an undeniable sincerity in her voice, an earnestness that couldn't be faked. Her large, cornflower blue eyes shimmered with a mix of defiance and vulnerability, framed by unruly blonde hair that, if brushed, might have been stunning. Her delicate features were striking, her lips shaped like a perfect, plump heart. And then there was her story, tragic but resilient, losing her parents and taking on the responsibility of raising her younger brother while still so young herself. It was exactly the kind of traditional family values, narrative that would appeal to Takasawa. Perhaps Orson was right. Maybe fate really had knocked on his door. You know what? Theo said, stroking his chin as a slow smile crept across his face. You're perfect. Amanda's eyes widened in surprise, a flicker of hope lighting up her features. Really? she asked, almost breathless. Really? Orson echoed, frozen mid-step. Theo nodded, calmly adjusting the papers on his desk. You're perfect to play the role of my fiancé. What? Amanda exclaimed, recoiling so fast that her chair wobbled precariously. What? Orson repeated, dropping his phone in disbelief. Theo held up his hands in a placating gesture, his smile turning just a touch sheepish. Please, hear me out, he began. I need a fake fiancé for the next two or three months. Months, Amanda interrupted, her voice rising an octave. Theo pressed on, ignoring her outburst. Most importantly, I need someone starting tomorrow evening and for the next two weeks. My potential business partners from Japan are visiting, and it's crucial that I present myself as a man preparing for a wedding. After the deal is finalized, we can pretend to break up and part ways. 
No strings attached. Do you understand? Amanda blinked at him, her mouth opening and closing like a fish gasping for air. Finally, she managed to croak out, no, not at all. Theo sighed, leaning back in his chair as he reached for a glass and filled it with water from a nearby pitcher. He handed it to Amanda, who took it with shaky hands, clearly still in shock. Okay, he said, his voice softening. Let me explain. For the next few minutes, Theo outlined the situation in painstaking detail. Takasawa's deep respect for family traditions, the importance of appearing stable and reliable, and how Lyra's sudden betrayal had thrown a wrench into everything. As he spoke, Amanda listened, her expression shifting from confusion to reluctant understanding. Don't say no right away, Theo warned, his tone calm but insistent. I'll help you. I'll rent an apartment for you and your brother, fix your ceiling, and pay you much better than a secretary or a mistress. But you have to keep this a secret and play your role. Would this amount as a down payment work for you? He scribbled a number on a piece of paper and slid it across the desk toward Amanda. She hesitated, her hand hovering over the note. When her eyes finally landed on the figure, her jaw dropped and she choked on her water, coughing violently. Is this a down payment? Amanda croaked, her voice hoarse. Theo nodded without hesitation, his expression unreadable. Her face turned scarlet as a thought struck her. This isn't for anything intimate, is it? She asked cautiously, her blush deepening with every word. Orson, who had been silently observing up to this point, burst into uncontrollable laughter. He doubled over, slapping the desk for emphasis, while Amanda shifted uncomfortably in her seat. Theo sighed, pinching the bridge of his nose. No, Amanda, he said his voice dry but patient. Nothing of the sort. I simply need someone who can convincingly play the role of a sweet, gentle fiancé in front of my guests. You understand? I don't have time to hold a casting call or screen for candidates. And frankly, he added, glancing at her with a hint of amusement, you're already here. Amanda's gaze darted between Theo and the piece of paper. The number scribbled on it seemed to glow, burning itself into her mind. It was an absurd amount of money, a sum that could change her and Kieran's lives. Despite her better judgment, she found herself on her feet, extending her hand. Deal, she declared, her voice steady with newfound determination. Theo stifled a chuckle, amused by her formality. As he shook her hand, he noted how cool, slender, and soft her fingers were. She didn't have a manicure or polished nails like the women he usually associated with, but there was something refreshingly genuine about her. For the remainder of the day, Theo worked with Amanda to prepare her for the upcoming meeting. Together they crafted their backstory, a whirlwind romance built on mutual respect and shared dreams. Orson hovered nearby, tossing in sarcastic quips until Theo finally lost patience. Orson, go back to your job, Theo snapped. What, and miss this drama? Not a chance. Orson grinned, but ultimately relented, leaving the two to continue uninterrupted. Later that evening, Theo drove Amanda to pick up her brother, Kieran, and gather their belongings. The apartment's damage was as bad as Amanda had described. The swollen ceiling looked ready to collapse at any moment. Theo didn't linger. He helped them pack what little they could and brought them back to his home. My house is big enough, Theo explained as he led them inside. There's plenty of space for both of you. And later, I'll arrange the apartment I promised. Kieran, a lively and sharp-witted boy of seven, quickly won Theo over with his curiosity and endless stream of questions. Do you own this entire house? He asked, wide-eyed as they walked through the spacious living room. Yes. Theo replied, amused. Whoa, does it have secret passages? Can I explore? Not tonight, Amanda interjected, ruffling Kieran's hair. You've had enough excitement for one day. Over dinner, which Theo had ordered from a local restaurant, conversation flowed more easily than any of them had anticipated. Theo found himself surprised by how naturally Amanda fit into the rhythm of his life. Her quick wit, 
balancing Kieran's chatter. At one point, as they laughed over Kieran's attempts to pronounce the names of the dishes, Theo leaned back in his chair, studying Amanda thoughtfully. You know, he said, his voice quieter now. It feels like we've known each other for a long time. Amanda paused, a smile tugging at her lips as she speared a piece of fish with her fork. Of course, she said lightly, popping the bite into her mouth. We're practically married. Theo blinked, caught off guard by her quick humor, but a slow smile spread across his face. Wait, what? Married? Kieran exclaimed, his fork clattering to his plate. His wide eyes darted between Amanda and Theo in disbelief. Amanda, suppressing a grin, turned to her brother and said with mock seriousness, Eat your veggies, Kieran. But- Veggies, she repeated, cutting him off with a playful look. Theo chuckled, shaking his head. Whatever he had expected when Amanda walked into his office that morning, this wasn't it. Finally, the big day arrived. Haruto Takasawa, the legendary businessman, and his elegant wife, Aiko, whose name had inspired Haruto's iconic company, arrived precisely on schedule. True to his meticulous nature, Theo personally picked them up from the airport. He ensured they were comfortably settled in their hotel before parting ways with the couple until the highly anticipated dinner. Back at home, Theo was on edge, pacing the living room as he waited for Amanda. He had arranged everything to the last detail. A nanny for Kieran, an appointment at a luxury beauty salon, and a visit to Silhouette's flagship boutique to complete Amanda's transformation. But despite his careful planning, Theo found himself uncharacteristically nervous. His nerves evaporated the moment he saw her. Amanda appeared at the top of the staircase, her hand lightly trailing along the railing as she descended. It felt like a scene from an old movie Theo had loved as a boy. Timeless and magical. She wasn't a model like Lyra, but Amanda had a captivating quality that took Theo's breath away. The white dress hugged her figure just enough to be elegant without overstatement, while her styled hair framed her delicate face, accentuating her cornflower blue eyes. She looked ethereal like someone who had stepped out of a dream. Theo offered her his arm, trying to maintain his composure, but when she took it, a warmth spread through his chest that startled him. The dinner exceeded all of Theo's expectations, thanks in large part to Amanda. Despite her initial nerves, she easily charmed Haruto and Aiko with her sincerity and humility. The story Theo had crafted about their whirlwind romance, layered with Amanda's real-life struggles, resonated deeply with the Takasawas. Haruto, in particular, seemed utterly captivated by Amanda's simplicity and grace. Toward the end of the evening, Haruto leaned forward, studying Amanda's face with a contemplative expression. Your face seems so familiar, he said softly. Could I have seen you somewhere before? Amanda blushed, giving him a shy smile. She shrugged her slim shoulders and replied, I don't think so. I've lived in America my whole life, and I've never appeared on billboards. Haruto nodded thoughtfully but continued to study her, as if trying to place a distant memory. The next two weeks were a whirlwind of activities. Theo and Amanda accompanied the Takasawas on tours, introducing them to the sights, sounds, and culture of America. Haruto and Aiko were delighted at every turn, thoroughly enjoying their time in Theo's company. One afternoon, Haruto pulled Theo aside, his tone unusually solemn. Take good care of her, he said, his dark eyes filled with quiet wisdom. Girls like her are diamonds in the dust. Theo glanced over at Amanda, who was laughing as she tried on a kimono Aiko had brought as a gift. Her laughter was unguarded and pure, filling the room like sunlight. Theo felt his chest tighten. Haruto was right. As the days passed, Theo found himself spending more and more time with Amanda and Kieran, not just for appearances, but because he wanted to. The three of them developed an unspoken routine that felt both effortless and comforting. Then Amanda surprised everyone with a spur-of-the-moment invitation. When she discovered that Haruto was a football fan, she invited him and Aiko, along with Theo, to one of Kieran's soccer matches. 
Kieran, playing goalkeeper, was a revelation. He moved with agility and precision, blocking every shot with confidence and determination. Even when his team's defence faltered, Kieran's sharp instincts and quick reflexes kept the opposing team from scoring. It was as if he had springs in his cleats, propelling him to reach impossible heights. After the match, Haruto clapped Kieran on the back, grinning like a proud uncle. You were magnificent, young man, he said. Kieran beamed under the praise, chattering excitedly about his favourite players as they strolled back toward the parking lot. The day didn't end there. Haruto and Aiko, charmed by the outing, suggested continuing the evening at Theo's home for dinner. Theo hesitated. Hosting an impromptu dinner wasn't part of the plan, and he feared the evening might unravel without proper preparation. But Amanda quickly put his worries to rest. We'll handle it, she assured him with a smile that left no room for doubt. Once home, Amanda took charge like a seasoned hostess. She ushered everyone into the kitchen, delegating tasks with natural ease. Haruto and Theo were assigned vegetable chopping duty, while Aiko was instructed to relax and enjoy a cup of tea. The Takasawas found the arrangement both amusing and endearing. Under Amanda's direction, the kitchen buzzed with activity. The aroma of freshly sautéed herbs filled the air, mingling with the sounds of laughter and conversation. By the time dinner was served, the table was laden with dishes that were as delicious as they were beautifully presented. The meal was a triumph, but the evening didn't end there. Afterward, they moved to the living room, where Amanda suggested playing charades and Monopoly. The sight of Haruto and Aiko attempting to act out clues, with Theo laughing so hard his stomach ached, was something Theo hadn't expected in a million years. Kieran, full of energy, threw himself into the games with gusto, and even Theo found himself swept up in the joy of the moment. By the end of the night, Theo couldn't remember the last time he'd felt so at ease. The warmth and laughter that filled his home felt real, not a facade for business, and he found himself silently hoping it wouldn't have to end. Theo began catching himself thinking about Amanda and Kieran more often than he cared to admit. It wasn't just idle musings either. He missed them when they weren't around. Amanda's sharp wit, Kieran's boundless energy, the way their presence filled his otherwise sterile home with warmth and life. At first, Theo tried to dismiss these feelings as part of the act. After all, their arrangement required them to spend time together, to appear as a family for the Takasawas. But as the days passed, the lines between what was real and what was staged began to blur. The business arrangement that had once felt so clear-cut now lingered in the background, overshadowed by something deeper, something Theo wasn't ready to name. One evening, Theo caught himself staring at the empty dining room table long after dinner. Amanda and Kieran had gone out for ice cream, and the house felt strangely hollow in their absence. He sighed, raking a hand through his hair. What the hell is happening to me? He muttered to himself. But Theo knew better than to act on impulse. Amanda had her own life, her own struggles, and he couldn't risk complicating things for her, or for Kieran, not when she'd trusted him to keep this arrangement professional. Orson noticed the subtle changes in Theo's demeanor almost immediately. The way he smiled a little more often, his tendency to glance at his phone as if expecting a message, and the way his eyes seemed to soften whenever Amanda or Kieran entered the room. It was all too telling. During a break in a meeting one afternoon, Orson cornered Theo with a sly grin and a glint of mischief in his eyes. So, Orson began casually, leaning against Theo's desk, you're not falling for your fake fiancé, are you? Theo froze mid-sip of his coffee, shooting Orson a look that was part disbelief and part irritation. Don't be ridiculous, he said, brushing off the comment with a wave of his hand but Orson wasn't so easily deterred. Oh, come on. You're acting different, my friend. Happier, softer even. And dare I say domesticated, he smirked, clearly enjoying himself. You've got that dreamy what-if look every time Amanda walks into the room. Admit it. Theo rolled his eyes, setting his coffee down with a little more force than necessary. I'm not dreamy, Orson, and it's not what you think. 
Amanda is here for one reason, the deal, that's all. Uh Uh-huh, Orson replied, unconvinced. He crossed his arms, his grin widening. Then why do you look like someone just slapped you with a romance novel every time her name comes up? Or better yet, why do you keep volunteering to pick Kieran up from school or help Amanda with her backstory? Face it, Theo, you're catching feelings. Theo scoffed, though his attempt at indifference was far from convincing. You're imagining things, he muttered, turning his attention to a stack of documents on his desk. Orson studied him for a moment, then shrugged, his grin never fading. Sure, boss, whatever you say. But just remember the heart's a tricky thing. Sometimes it doesn't care about deals or logic. That fateful morning, Theo descended the stairs, the enticing aroma of freshly brewed coffee and something sweet drawing him to the kitchen. As he entered, the soft hum of music filled the air, a cheerful tune that seemed to match the warmth of the scene before him. Amanda was at the stove, swaying lightly to the rhythm as she flipped pancakes with practiced ease. Her hair was loosely tied back, a few stray strands framing her face, and the sunlight streaming through the window seemed to cast a halo around her. Kieran was already at the table, happily munching away, a smear of syrup on his cheek. Good morning, Kieran, Theo greeted, holding out his hand. The boy beamed, raising his sticky palm for their customary high five. Good morning, Theo. Theo smacked his small hand, chuckling. What's the plan today, champ? A day off? Nope, I've got practice, Kieran announced proudly, puffing out his chest. Amanda turned from the stove, a spatula in one hand and a smile that could rival the morning sun. Her eyes sparkled as she glanced at them, and Theo felt a familiar warmth spreading in his chest. Will you have breakfast? She asked in a sing-song tone. I made pancakes and even got your favorite jam. You said you like apricots, right? Theo blinked, momentarily caught off guard by her thoughtfulness. Such a simple gesture, yet it felt significant. She wasn't declaring her love, just remembering his favorite jam. Yeah, he replied, his voice softer than usual. My grandma used to make apricot jam. She was from Utah. They had so many apricots in her orchard, they even fed them to the pigs. And she'd send us bags of walnuts from the same orchard every year. He trailed off, suddenly self-conscious about rambling, but Amanda lit up, her smile widening. I love walnuts, she exclaimed, sliding a pancake onto a plate and setting it in front of him. Now, sit down and eat while they're hot. Theo obeyed without protest, suddenly feeling an odd sense of home in her command. As he reached for the syrup, a fleeting thought crossed his mind. I'd buy her all the walnuts in the world if she asked. Maybe I should just plant a walnut tree in the yard. And at the moments like these had become a regular part of their lives. The house, once cold and empty, now brimmed with warmth and laughter, like they had been living together for years. One evening they went to the ballet. Haruto and Aiko had insisted on treating them to a performance. Amanda's eyes sparkled with wonder as the dancers moved across the stage, her cheeks glowing pink with excitement. Theo barely glanced at the performance, too mesmerized by her profile. The delicate curve of her jaw, the way her lips parted slightly in awe. Haruto, seated beside him, nudged him with a playful smirk. You're missing the show, he whispered. Theo smiled but didn't take his eyes off Amanda. No, I'm not, he replied, his voice low. Then there was the day they went cycling. Amanda, determined to keep up with Theo and Kieran, skidded on a puddle and lost control of her bike. She landed in a heap on the ground, and Theo, rushing to help her, stumbled over his own bike and tumbled on top of her. Panic surged through him. Are you okay? Amanda, are you hurt? He asked frantically. But Amanda lay beneath him, dirty, soaked, and laughing so hard tears streamed down her cheeks. I'm fine, but I think I'll leave the Tour de France to you, she managed between giggles. Theo found himself laughing too, the sound deep and unrestrained, echoing through the quiet trail. And then there was Kieran, ever the little troublemaker. One afternoon determined to help, he decided to wash his soccer uniform by himself. The boy had overdone it with the detergent, 
and soon the laundry room was a frothy wonderland of foam. When Theo walked in to find Kieran standing amidst the chaos, his face pale with worry, the boy stammered, I, I'm sorry, Theo, please don't be mad. Theo surveyed the scene, then grinned. Mad? This isn't a disaster, it's a foam party. Before long, all three of them were laughing and playing in the foam, slipping and sliding until they were soaked and breathless. As Theo dried off later that evening, he realized these moments weren't part of any arrangement. They were real. Amanda and Kieran weren't just filling the house, they were filling his life. And for the first time in years, Theo felt like he was truly living. With only days left before the Takasawa's departure, Theo hosted one final dinner at his home. The atmosphere was warm and celebratory, with laughter filling the air as they reminisced about the past weeks. Haruto, ever composed yet deeply thoughtful, stood and raised a glass of sake. The room quieted instantly. We've decided to stay in America a little longer, Haruto announced, his voice steady and resonant. Aiko has fallen in love with your country, and I've been inspired by the unique charm of your culture. I want to incorporate a local touch into my next clothing line. He turned to Theo, his gaze piercing yet sincere. And I hope we'll work on it together. What do you think? Theo's chest swelled with relief and triumph, all the pressure, all the effort it had paid off. He glanced at Amanda, who was seated beside him, and felt her hand squeeze his under the table. Her touch was warm and reassuring, grounding him in the moment. When he looked at her, she smiled, a quiet encouragement shining in her eyes. I think, Theo said, lifting his own glass, his voice steady and confident. We're in for prosperity and an excellent partnership. The table erupted in applause and cheerful toasts, and for the first time in months, Theo felt an overwhelming sense of accomplishment. His hard work, the risks he'd taken, they had all come together. As Haruto and Aiko laughed and sipped their sake, Theo felt Amanda's presence beside him more profoundly than ever. She wasn't just part of the arrangement anymore, she was part of the reason this moment felt so complete. The victory seemed secure. Plans to finalize the contract were underway, and Theo was already looking ahead to the promising future of his company. But the illusion of perfection shattered one morning when Haruto unexpectedly arrived at Theo's office, his calm demeanor replaced with visible fury. I didn't know you were capable of this, Haruto said, his voice trembling with anger. I trusted you. You brought me into your home, sat me at your table, and all along you were lying to me. Theo froze. He had never seen Haruto like this. The man's face was flushed, his usually composed features marred by frustration and disappointment. Theo stood abruptly, his chair scraping loudly against the floor. Haruto, what are you talking about? He stammered, bewildered. I don't understand. Your relationship with Amanda, Haruto cut him off, his voice sharp and accusatory. It's a farce, isn't it? A charade. How could you deceive me like this? Theo's blood ran cold. His mind raced, searching for how Haruto could have discovered the truth. Please let me explain, Theo blurted, rushing to intercept Haruto before he could storm out. His palms were clammy, his pulse erratic. I, I really did have a fiancé, but she betrayed me right before your visit. I panicked, Haruto. I didn't want you to think I made up stories about the wedding just to lure you here. I thought I'd lose everything if I didn't. And so you decided to lie to me for real, Haruto interrupted, his voice bitter. His eyes locked onto Theo's, filled with a mixture of anger and disappointment. You know, Theo, I liked you. You were the first person in years to convince me to return to this country to reconsider my stance on partnerships here. Haruto paused, his face hardening. But Amanda, she's the reason we stayed longer. Her kindness, her authenticity. That wasn't part of the deal, was it? You used her too, didn't you? Haruto fell silent, his gaze distant as if he were sifting through memories buried long ago. Finally, he sighed heavily, his shoulders sagging under the weight of unspoken truths. Do you want to know the truth? 
he asked, his voice quieter now. Something the journalists digging into my past never uncovered? Theo nodded solemnly, sensing the depth of what Haruto was about to share. I was never accepted here. Neither was my mother, Haruto began, his words deliberate, each syllable carrying years of pain. Some people whispered behind her back, calling me a slant-eyed, dark-skinned freak. Others didn't bother to whisper. Some nearly spat in her face. Back then, tolerance wasn't something you could expect from everyone. Haruto's voice wavered for a moment before regaining its steady cadence. It wasn't everyone, of course. We just had bad luck with the people around us. My school years weren't any better. Even my name, Haruto, was mocked. My mother had named me after my father. He paused, his eyes narrowing slightly as if reliving those difficult moments. My only real friend was a fellow soldier I met in the army. He wasn't even from this town. Later I changed. I learned to stand up for myself and found my passion. Life improved, and the people around me changed. But deep down, there's still that wounded child inside me. Do you understand? Haruto's voice grew heavier with emotion. And then, years later, I discovered my grandmother in Japan. Theo listened intently as Haruto continued. Her son, my father, confessed to a fling during a business trip and showed her letters my mother had sent him. My grandmother was a formidable woman, someone who believed in doing what was right. She ordered my father to take responsibility, especially since she had no other grandchildren. That's how my mother and I moved to live with her in Japan. There, for the first time, I was accepted. It was like being welcomed into a family I didn't know I had. Haruto's eyes glistened as he looked at Theo. But here, I was the ugly duckling on a chicken farm, like in the fairy tale, remember? Theo nodded again, though Haruto seemed lost in his own memories, barely noticing. Life is strange, Haruto continued, his tone introspective. Even in Japan, where I finally earned recognition and respect, I couldn't forget this place. I missed it. No matter what I achieved, my homeland remained a part of me. You can't erase that from your heart. There's something special about this country, Theo. But for the longest time, I had no one to return to, no reason to come back, until you appeared. Haruto turned his sharp gaze toward Theo, his voice tinged with frustration and sorrow. You were so persistent, so open. And then I got to know Amanda and Kieran. To be honest, I grew fond of them. They reminded me of something I thought I'd lost, a sense of belonging. His expression darkened, disappointment clouding his features. And then I found out you were deceiving me, fooling me all along. Haruto shook his head, disbelief evident in his furrowed brow. If you had told me the truth, Theo, I would have still liked you. I even liked your business ideas. But how can I trust someone who has lied to me once? Trust isn't something you gamble with, Theo. Theo felt the weight of those words like a stone sinking in his chest. He wanted to argue, to defend himself, to beg for forgiveness. But when he opened his mouth, no words came. Instead, he exhaled heavily and met Haruto's gaze. I, I understand, Theo said finally, his voice heavy with regret. Haruto nodded, a bittersweet acceptance in his expression, and turned to leave. This time, there were no pleasantries, no handshakes. The click of the door echoed through the room, leaving Theo standing alone, feeling the emptiness left in Haruto's wake. Theo returned home in a foul mood, his chest tight with frustration and regret. As he stepped into the backyard, the sound of laughter greeted him. Amanda and Kieran were playing ball, their carefree joy in stark contrast to the storm raging within him. Join us, Amanda called out, her smile radiant. Kieran says I can't kick the ball hard enough. You kick like a girl, Kieran teased giggling from his makeshift goal. Amanda rolled her eyes in mock annoyance, but her laughter rang out, light and unbothered. For a brief moment, Theo felt the warmth of their happiness trying to pierce his hardened shell. 
but the pang in his chest only sharpened, and he pushed it aside with a deep scowl. It's time for you to leave, Theo said, his tone cold and clipped. Amanda froze mid-step, her smile faltering. What? You need to leave, Theo repeated, his jaw tight. It's over. Amanda's brows furrowed in confusion, her hand instinctively brushing a stray strand of hair behind her ear. Oh, she said hesitantly. So, you signed the contract? No, Theo snapped. Then why? Because there won't be a contract, Theo barked, his voice rising. It was all for nothing, understand. And the best part, Amanda, Takasawa found out you're not my fiancé. Funny, isn't it? Who can't keep their mouth shut? Amanda's face flushed, her confusion turning to indignation. It wasn't me, I swear, she shot back, her voice shaking. Then who was it? Theo demanded, his anger spilling over. Only you. I and your brother knew, and now Haruto knows. It's over, do you understand? My company is going under. My father will rub my nose in it, reminding me I bit off more than I could chew. He took a step closer, his frustration boiling over. Takasawa will find another partner. There'll be a line of eager suitors at his door. They'll all swoop in and take the opportunity I created. It was me who brought him here, me who pitched the idea of a new collection. I dropped everything for this. And now it's all gone to waste. Theo's breathing was labored, his chest rising and falling with the weight of his emotions. Amanda stared at him, her expression a mix of reproach and hurt. You're blaming me for this? She asked softly, her voice tinged with disbelief. Theo faltered, her words cutting through his anger. For a moment he looked at her as though he might apologize, but the vulnerability in her gaze made him turn away. He hardened himself again. Pack your things, he said coldly. I'll call a car for you, and I'll pay you as promised. Don't bother, Amanda said, her voice trembling with restrained anger. You've already paid me more than enough, she turned to Kieran, her cheeks flushed. Kieran, let's go, it's time to leave. But this is home, Kieran said, confused, looking between his sister and Theo. No, Amanda said, her voice softening as she knelt to meet Kieran's eyes. Our home, Kieran, I told you, we were just guests here. Kieran looked up at Theo, his young face full of questions. He started to run toward him, but Amanda gently pulled him back, guiding him inside. They didn't say another word as they packed their belongings. Theo stayed in the backyard, staring blankly at the ball lying in the grass. He heard the faint sound of the taxi pulling up and the soft thud of luggage being loaded into the trunk. But he didn't come out to say goodbye. Inside the taxi, Amanda sat silently, Kieran leaning against her side. The driver confirmed the address and she nodded without looking up. As they drove away, she stared out the window, her fingers fiddling with a small cross around her neck. A simple keepsake from her father. The cross was unusual, one arm of the crucifix missing. Her father had always sworn it was his talisman. During the accident that took his and her mother's lives, he hadn't been wearing it. Amanda sometimes wondered if things would have turned out differently if he had. She had rarely worn the cross recently, choosing instead the jewelry Theo had insisted on for appearances. My fiancé should look the part, he had said. She hadn't argued then. But now every piece of jewelry and every dress he had given her lay behind in the room she'd stayed in. She hadn't taken anything, even though Theo had called them gifts. They didn't feel like hers. They never had. As the taxi wound its way into the bustling city center, Amanda caught sight of a familiar building, the hotel where the Takasawas were staying. Her heart raced. Stop, she called out. Could you stop by that hotel? It's important. The driver nodded, pulling over near the entrance. Amanda, clutching Kieran's hand, rushed through the grand lobby and up to the suite she had visited before. She hesitated briefly before knocking. The door opened and Aiko appeared her delicate features lighting up momentarily before her expression shifted to concern. Oh, Amanda, Aiko said, her English slightly formal but clear. What have you done? Haruto is very upset. Amanda's breath hitched, but she didn't waver. I know, and I'm so sorry. Where is he? Please, I need to speak with him. 
Aiko hesitated, her sharp eyes studying Amanda's earnest face. After a moment, she stepped aside and opened the door wider. He's in the study, Aiko said gently. She glanced down at Kieran and then back at Amanda. Let me take the boy to dinner downstairs. You and Haruto can talk. Thank you, Amanda said, her voice thick with gratitude. She knelt down to Kieran's level. Go with Aiko, okay? Be good. Kieran frowned, confused but obedient. He took Aiko's hand, and Amanda watched them until they disappeared around the corner. Then, summoning all her courage, she entered the study. Haruto was seated at the desk, his back to the door. He was reviewing documents, but the tension in his posture was unmistakable. At the sound of footsteps, he muttered something in Japanese before glancing over his shoulder. His expression shifted from irritation to surprise. Oh, I thought it was Aiko, Haruto said, setting the papers aside. Amanda didn't give herself time to hesitate. She stepped forward, then dropped to her knees, bowing deeply. Please forgive us, she said, her voice steady despite the weight of her emotions. Haruto's eyes widened, and he immediately stood, moving around the desk to lift her up. Stop, my dear. There's no need for this, he said flustered. I'm sure this wasn't your idea to fool us. But Amanda stayed where she was, her hands clenched into fists. Please listen to me, she begged. Haruto paused, then sighed heavily. All right, he said, relenting. But stand up first. There is no need for such a gesture. Amanda nodded and rose slowly, her face flushed, but determined. She clasped her hands together and met Haruto's gaze, her voice trembling but sincere as she began. You see, Theo loves his work deeply. I've had the chance to get to know him, and I've never seen anyone so dedicated to his craft. His company isn't just a job to him, it's his inheritance, his family's legacy. The contract with you isn't about greed or ambition, it's about survival. She paused swallowing hard before continuing. Theo may have made mistakes, but he genuinely helped me and my brother when no one else would. He gave us a home, stability, and a chance to start over. No matter his reasons, he's a good man. And... Amanda hesitated, lowering her gaze as her voice faltered. And I don't think we lied to you. I didn't lie. Haruto's brows furrowed, his expression softening as realization dawned on him. His voice was gentle, almost teasing. My dear, he said, tilting his head. You're in love with him, aren't you? Amanda's face turned crimson, and she looked away, her hands trembling slightly. It doesn't matter anymore, she said softly. What does matter is that you won't find a better partner than Theo. He's exactly what you're looking for passionate, loyal, and determined. And I believe he can help bring your vision to life. Haruto fell silent, his sharp eyes studying her intently. Slowly, he walked back to his desk, his hand resting on the chair as he pondered her words. You have conviction, he said finally, and courage. You remind me of someone I knew long ago, someone who believed in me when no one else did. Amanda didn't respond, unsure if she'd done enough. Her fingers absentmindedly played with the cross hanging from her neck, a small, battered keepsake she rarely took off. Haruto's gaze shifted from her face to the necklace. Suddenly, his expression changed, his eyes narrowing in disbelief. Amanda, he said, his voice almost a whisper, show me that, show me the cross. Startled, Amanda froze. What, this? she asked, holding the cross in her fingers. Please, Haruto urged, stepping closer, his hands trembling slightly. Let me see it. Hesitant but sensing his urgency, Amanda removed the necklace and placed it into Haruto's outstretched hands. He held it carefully as if it might shatter, his eyes fixed on the worn metal. I can't believe it, Haruto murmured, his voice thick with emotion. He turned the cross over in his hands, inspecting every scratch and imperfection. Where did you get this? It belonged to my father, Amanda replied, her voice steady despite her confusion. Haruto's jaw tightened, and he swallowed hard, 
a flash of pain crossing his features. Do you know why it's missing a piece? Amanda nodded slowly. He broke it during his time in the army, she said, her tone uncertain. Haruto's breath hitched. His eyes, now glistening with unshed tears, shot back up to meet Amanda's. Yes, he whispered, his voice cracking. That's how it happened. That's exactly how it happened. He stared at her, his hands still clutching the cross. How did I not realize it sooner? Haruto said, his tone incredulous. You look just like him, just like Elias. Amanda's heart stopped. You knew my father, she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. But how? Haruto exhaled deeply, the weight of his memories seeming to press down on him. He moved to sit in the chair by the desk, holding the cross tightly as if it anchored him to the moment. Elias, Haruto began, his voice heavy with emotion. Your father and I served in the army together. He was the only person who stood up for me when no one else would. When the others mocked me, shunned me, and tried to make me feel like I didn't belong, Elias refused to join in. He called them out. He became my closest friend. Haruto's gaze drifted toward the window, though his mind seemed far away. During a training exercise, something went wrong. A grenade misfired. It was chaos. I thought I was going to die. But Elias, he paused, his voice catching. He didn't hesitate. He shielded me, pulled me out of the blast zone. He saved my life. Amanda listened, her hands trembling. She had heard bits and pieces about her father's time in the army, but never this. When it was over, Haruto continued, his lips curling into a faint, bittersweet smile. He laughed. He said, looks like I got off easy, huh? Or maybe God decided I'm not done yet. Haruto's grip tightened around the cross. He told me he left a piece of his cross behind that day, a reminder of how close he'd come to losing everything. Amanda felt tears welling in her eyes. He never told me about you, she whispered. But he always said the cross was important, that it protected him. Haruto nodded solemnly. It did, and now it's protecting you. He looked back at her, his expression softening. Elias was the bravest, kindest man I ever knew. If you're even half as strong as he was, Amanda, you're remarkable. Amanda wiped her eyes, overcome with emotion. Thank you, she said quietly, for telling me. After hearing Amanda's heartfelt story, Haruto couldn't refuse her plea. Collecting himself, he made his way back to Silhouette's office. Theo, who had been preparing for the worst, was stunned when Haruto walked in and signed the contract without hesitation. As Haruto set the pen down, Theo could barely contain his astonishment. Why did you change your mind? He asked, his voice tinged with disbelief. Haruto's gaze remained steady. Ask Amanda, he said simply. She pleaded for you. On her knees, he paused as if weighing his next words carefully. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. She's a rare gem in the dust. Don't lose her, Theo. Theo's heart skipped at the mention of Amanda, but his confusion lingered. But wasn't she the one who told you the truth? He asked hesitantly. Haruto frowned slightly, shaking his head. What? No. I received an anonymous letter. The weight of Haruto's words hit Theo like a blow. His mind reeled. He had been so certain Amanda had betrayed him. But now, faced with the truth, doubt flooded in. It hadn't been her handwriting. And the more he thought about it, the more he realized Amanda wasn't capable of such treachery. Haruto's words echoed in his mind. Don't lose her, Theo. Throwing everything aside, Theo resolved to find Amanda and set things right. But first, he needed to hand over his responsibilities. As he approached Orson's office, intending to delegate tasks, he heard a familiar voice that stopped him cold. Lyra, why are you here? He doesn't want to see you, Orson's voice grumbled from behind the door. But you do, don't you? Lyra teased, her tone dripping with seduction. Theo's stomach turned as he peeked through the slightly ajar door. Lyra leaned in, kissing Orson provocatively. Not here, Orson hissed, pulling back. Do you want everything to fall apart? We're already in enough trouble. First, 
Theo caught on to us, and we lost the chance to grab his assets after the wedding. Lucky for us, he never found out who you were meeting. And now it's even worse, that damn Japanese guy came back and demanded the contract. Why? What the hell? Did I waste my time spilling the beans about the deception? Did I sabotage all the designers for nothing? Theo's blood ran cold as the pieces fell into place. Orson had been the informant, the saboteur, and Lyra. She had been his accomplice all along. Lyra giggled, her laugh light and mocking. You're so angry, she teased, her lips curling into a sly smile. Greedy and envious too. You want everything Theo has, his company, his fiance. That's kind of exciting, you know. Yeah, yeah. Orson muttered, brushing her off. You know, ever since he broke up with that other chick, Theo's been walking around like a beaten dog. Maybe you should make a move and get back with him. We can go back to plan A. You marry him and then we'll deal with the business. Theo's fists clenched, his heart pounding with rage. Every suspicion he'd ignored, every offhand remark Orson had made, now sharpened into clarity. The betrayal wasn't just professional, it was personal. The next day, Theo walked into Orson's office with a resolve as cold as steel. Orson, lounging in his chair and scrolling through his phone, looked up and smirked, clearly unaware of what was coming. Morning, boss, Orson said casually. Theo shut the door firmly behind him, his expression unreadable. He walked over to Orson's desk, standing tall and imposing. I know what you've done, Orson. Theo said, his voice low but carrying an unmistakable edge. Orson's smirk faltered, replaced by a flicker of unease. What are you talking about? He asked, feigning ignorance. Theo slammed a file onto the desk, making Orson jump. Don't play dumb. I heard everything yesterday. The sabotage, the anonymous letter to Haruto, and your pathetic little scheme with Lyra. You betrayed me, Orson, both as a colleague and as a friend. Orson's face paled, but he quickly composed himself, leaning back in his chair with an air of mock confidence. All right, so I might have given Haruto a heads up about your fake fiancé. But come on, Theo, you're acting like a saint. You lied to him too. I made mistakes, Theo admitted, his voice cold and measured. But my mistakes were out of desperation to save this company, to protect what my family built. You, on the other hand, were motivated by greed and jealousy. You wanted to destroy me. You sabotaged our designers, undermined my trust, and conspired with Lyra behind my back. You're no better than a parasite. Orson stood abruptly, his hands gripping the edge of the desk. You don't get it, do you? I did what I had to do. You think you're untouchable because you're Theo Alaric? Because your daddy handed you this company on a silver platter? You don't deserve this. You never did. Theo stared at him, the anger in his chest cooling into something sharper. Disappointment. I thought you were my friend, he said quietly, shaking his head. I trusted you. I defended you, gave you chances you didn't deserve. And this is how you repay me? By trying to destroy everything I've worked for? Orson's jaw clenched, but he didn't respond. Theo straightened, his voice regaining its edge. Effective immediately, you no longer work for Silhouette. Security will escort you out within the hour. And more importantly, Orson. Theo's voice grew softer, more cutting. You're no longer my friend. For a moment, silence hung heavy in the room. Orson's face twisted with anger and frustration, but he didn't argue. He knew it was over. Theo turned on his heel and strode toward the door. Before leaving, he paused, glancing back at the man who had once been his closest confidant. Enjoy whatever scraps Lyra throws your way. That's all you'll have left. Without waiting for a response, Theo walked out, leaving Orson to stew in the ruins of his own betrayal. After leaving the office, Theo drove straight to Amanda's modest apartment. His heart pounded with a mix of anticipation and fear, but he didn't hesitate. This wasn't about pride or saving face. It was about doing what he should have done long ago. When he arrived, he paused for a moment outside her door, trying to steady his breath. The faint sounds of laughter and muffled conversation drifted through the thin walls. 
Kieran's high-pitched voice was unmistakable, and the sound tugged at Theo's chest. Summoning his courage, he knocked. The laughter stopped abruptly, replaced by Amanda's familiar voice. Coming, she called. When she opened the door, her face shifted from surprise to guardedness. She didn't invite him in. Theo, she said evenly, what are you doing here? He didn't answer right away. Instead, he took a deep breath, stepped back, and, to Amanda's utter astonishment, knelt on one knee. Theo, she exclaimed, her hand flying to her mouth. What are you doing? Get up. But Theo didn't move. For the first time in his life, he knelt before someone. Not for a business deal or out of obligation, but for her. I need you to hear me out, Amanda, he said, his voice trembling slightly. I made a terrible mistake. I doubted you, and I hurt you in ways you didn't deserve. I let my anger, my pride, and my fear blind me. I assumed the worst when you were only ever trying to help me. Amanda's eyes softened, but she didn't interrupt. The truth is, Theo continued, I've never felt the way I do about you with anyone else. You made my house a home. You brought light into my life when I didn't even realize how dark it had become. And you, and Kieran, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Amanda swallowed hard, her fingers clutching the edge of the door. I was wrong, Theo admitted, his voice breaking slightly. And I don't deserve your forgiveness. But I'm here to ask for it, anyway. Amanda didn't need Theo to kneel or pour his heart out, though his sincerity touched her deeply. She would have forgiven him anyway. Because when you truly love someone, you find it in yourself to forgive so much, even when the hurt cuts deep. And Amanda, she loved Theo. As she stood there, watching him fumble for the right words, his vulnerability laid bare, her resolve softened. She saw not just the proud businessman or the man who had hurt her, but someone who was trying, genuinely trying, to make things right. Sometimes, Life has a strange way of leading us down winding painful roads, Amanda thought. A string of misfortunes, missteps and misunderstandings can seem cruel and purposeless, but often they guide us towards something greater. Theo had knocked on her door that evening, and in his eyes she saw the flicker of hope she had longed for. As she let him in, she realized that sometimes Immense happiness isn't about grand gestures or perfect timing. It's about being ready to open the door when love, messy, flawed, and utterly human, comes knocking. And for Amanda, this moment felt like the start of something truly beautiful.